He was in chapter 8. Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, our Almighty God, we thank you so very much for the blessings of this life and the opportunity that we have to gather together to study a portion of your word and, and the worship time to follow. Father, we pray that as we go throughout your word that uh, we look at it and, and see the world in, in which our son came and those uh, leaders of the early church live that we might uh, take from them and learn how to be humble servants, how to do those things that are pleasing to you. Father, we pray that you would be with those of our number who are unable to be here and watch over them and keep them, and if it be your will that they be returned back to us at the appropriate time, that we might be encouraged uh, by their presence and lift them up as well. Forgive us where we fail you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I, apo I apologize. I, I looked on the, uh, on the monitor for the security camera, and the time there said 925. So I still thought I had five minutes. I apologize, though. Um, I won't let it. I won't let it happen again. I promise. Shame on me. Uh, so for um, for at least the next couple of weeks, probably the the month of June. Uh, going to have John on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Uh, that way we can at least get caught up to a fair distance to where, closer to where we should be. Uh, you know, with, uh, with COVID uh, this last year and us not meeting for class and Barry and I recording the sermons, that, that obviously threw a wrench in how far along we would be. We missed several months uh, from, from not having classes. But then, because uh, I had asked for suggestions on, uh, on what to do, and I did get one suggestion, so that one suggestion won. Uh, so we are, uh, after those few weeks, or after June, so starting in July, Wednesday nights will be John, and then Sunday mornings we'll be going through the Minor Prophets and, and looking at them. And those, uh, those are shorter books than John, so we should be able to get through all of the minor prophets. I'm thinking probably by 2026 at least. So that's true. And you know, I mean, there's black fungus in India that's killing people now. And there's all these variants. So we could go into another pandemic and finish it out around 2042. I don't know. So. On Wednesday, and if you're watching this online, then you can just go back uh, to our YouTube channel, Freetown Road uh, Church of Christ, and you can pick up the Wednesday classes there and, and kind of catch up where we are. Uh, so we're in John chapter 7. Um, we l left off with uh, verse 24. And I know that some of you might have been thinking, because we were going over this whole do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And then we took this detour on uh, what about judging not, right, uh, from Matthew 7 and verse 1, well, why not judge? Uh, part of the reason, if you haven't noticed, then generally when going through the classes, if we reach a, a topic that there might be some contention over or uh, just flat out doctrinal division, then we'll usually spend some time looking at that particular topic rather than going through and then revisiting it. So if you were left wondering why in the world is Mike talking about Judge Not on Wednesday night, that was, uh, that was the reason because we will have people, even those in the church, who say we should not judge. And when we get to this, don't judge according to appearance, but you can judge, then to the unlearned, it can appear as, as a contradiction. And so we definitely want to address that. So did anybody have anything that maybe came up from Wednesday, if you were here in the Wednesday class that you thought about and wanted to bring up since now we are in John? Okay. So picking up in verse 25 of uh, John chapter 7, so some of the people in Jerus of Jerusalem were saying, is this not the man whom they are seeking to kill? Look, he's speaking publicly, and they are saying nothing to him. To him, The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? So Jesus is teaching a, about the Sabbath and his reference to 
and his reference to the people seeking to kill him in verses 19 through 23, it leads some Jerusalemites to conclude that he is the man that the authorities are seeking to kill. Because remember before, we're, we're at a pilgrimage feast. We have several who are just pilgrims, and they know nothing about Christ. And they're coming from different areas. And if you want a, a more comprehensive list of the areas they were coming from, you can look at Acts chapter 2, uh, because there they were for Pentecost and you know, it says Parthian Medes and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia, Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and all these other places. So that kind of gives you a general consensus, but they didn't know about Christ. So they ask him, you know, you have a demon or, or you're nuts. You know, who's trying to kill you? Because they didn't know anything about him. But then there are some who are saying, is this not the man who, who they're looking to kill? The, the rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? All right, so they realize that Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah in verse, uh, verse 26. So the fact that he's speaking publicly and without interference from the authorities, it raises the question of whether the authorities have concluded that Jesus is the Messiah after all. Because remember, at this point, there's been a whole lot of grumbling back and forth. Some people saying he's a good man. Some people saying he has a demon. Some people saying, no, he's, he's just causing trouble. Uh, maybe even some, like they would call Paul when they, they said he was a babbler. A uh, babbler being a seed picker, someone picking from this doctrine and that doctrine and just kind of piecing everything together. Um, and so now, it, you know, he's not getting any interference at this point. So it's kind of, well, have they, have they decided that, that he's the Christ? You know, have, they, have they figured that, that out yet? Because if a false teaching is not opposed, then people start to get the impression that it's either not false teaching or that it is a significant teaching. And that's the same thing today. If we as Christians do not oppose false teaching, then those who look at us could say that we either condone false teaching or that it's not really false teaching at all. And so there's no problems. So what difference does it make? And if we were to go back to, you know, the, the 20th century and we would look at figures in the church, Guy in Woods, Gus Nichols, even going further back with Foy Wallace uh, Jr. And, and what have you, we would see debate after debate after debate after debate held to address these various doctrines. People weren't afraid of it. I think the last debate that I saw, uh, there was one with a gentleman by the name of Kevin Colley, who, if I remember correctly, he uh, deb debated the atheist uh, Dan Barker. Don Barker, Dan, Don, Dan uh, Barker. That was the last debate that I saw, not to say that they don't happen. I know there was Ken Ham and, uh, you know, Bill Nye, the science guy and all that type of stuff. But anyhow, so the, that's the idea. You have all of these people coming, some of them who are aware of who Christ was, because remember, they, they said where they thought he was from. And the idea was that where the Messiah comes from, no one is supposed to know. Other people don't know who he is or why they're seeking to kill him because they're pilgrimage, uh, uh, pilgrims. And then there's some who are there and they're like, isn't this the guy that they're supposed to kill? But they're not opposing him. So if they're not opposing him, then, what he's, then he's either the Messiah or what he's saying is right or, or some other reason. So the people think that the authorities, they might be a little bit confused. And when we'll learn later in chapter 9 that the authorities themselves are actually divided uh, over Jesus. Uh, but these Jerusalemites, uh, they assume that uh, the authorities, um, that they couldn't have con concluded, here we go. can't talk this morning, that Jesus is the Messiah because he doesn't fit uh, their expectations for the Messiah. So he comes into verse 27, however, we know where this man is from, but whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where he's from. Because remember, he's not known as the, this official title of the Messiah, except by some, his, you know, of course, maybe his, his inner circle, right? Um, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God, you know, Peter's confession and whatnot, or even the demons, 
uh, when he approaches, they say, you know, Jesus, son of God. So there are some who certainly recognize him, but he's not known as the Christ or as the Messiah on a popular level. But we know where this man's from, uh, but wherever the Christ is coming from, you know, no one is supposed to know. And not only that, but that's also an allusion to the thought that when Jesus returns, no man knows what? Yeah, no one knows the day or the hour. No one knows when, when he's coming back. And so this is kind of a, a foreshadowing of, of that uh, thought as well. So the one hidden with God has now come forth. He's revealed himself uh, in response to, to their kind of musings. And he says, then Jesus, in verse 28, cried out into the temp in the temple teaching and saying, you both know me and know where I am from, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. Now, we remember before that uh, Jesus telling them, you can't know God, or accusing them, you can't say that you know God and that you don't know me. You can't say you know me without knowing God. So he begins by saying, yes, you know me and you know where I'm from. So he's keeping with this, this Jewish understanding. A person is usually known by where he or she comes from. So to know where Jesus is from is to know him. Now, I'm not talking about knowing him in the intimate sense of he is the son of God. It's simply, uh, I know him because I know where he's from, right? That, that, it's just a, a general, general type of knowing. But it's ironic because their knowledge of him as a Nazarene misses the most significant truth uh, of his origin because they're judging by appearance, which is what he just said in verse 24. Do not judge based on appearance. Judge with righteous judgment. So, you're going, so you know me in the sense that, sure, you know my name, you know my dad, my earthly father, uh, you know the town that I'm from, and y'all have already had some complaints about that, but you're judging based on appearance. So no, you really don't know me. And so he's kind of getting on to that, and again, it's somewhat ironic because they don't really know where he's from because he's from God. If they were judging righteously, and if you remember on Wednesday, we talked about the righteous judgment being the commands of God, being the word of God. If we judge according to the word, which even though they didn't have this, they still had Moses and, and his writings, and they had the Psalms of David and Asaph and what have you. And Christ said in John chapter 5, if you believed Moses, you would believe me because Moses wrote of me. He said, if you believe the scriptures, the scriptures speak of me. The works that I do, they speak of me. So if they, were, if they stopped judging based on appearance, which is what he was against in, chapter, in verse 24, and they judged righteously according to the standard of God, then they would know who he was. And if they knew who he was, they would know who God is because of him being sent. Does that make sense? It really, it really is a, a circular thought that the only way that you can know Christ is through the word of God. And that coincides with Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the testimony of Christ or hearing by the word of God, depending on your translation. So you come to know Christ and that's how you come to know God. It's, it's a cyclical process, but it's the same even today. People can't come to know Christ without the word. They might believe in a higher, uh, a higher creation, a higher being, or something like that, but you can't know the God of the Bible without the Bible because the Bible is the testimony of God, right? Any thoughts or, or comments? Okay. Okay. I can, I'm at least seeing shaking heads, so I know you're more awake now than Wednesday night, especially, you know, because of the meal and, and everything. 
So Jesus, he, he continues uh, by speaking again of the Father, of his dependency on the Father, because remember, he is all about doing the Father's will. He, compl- he accused them that they weren't seeking God's glory. They were seeking only the glory that came from men. So really, what type of glory is that? So he's talking about the Father, his dependency on the Father. He said he doesn't speak for himself in verses 17 and 18. And that fact uh, establishes that he is, that he's true in, uh, in verse 18. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, so God, he's true. And there's no unrighteousness in him. You know, there's a lot of times people will ask, well, why didn't Jesus ever just come out and say, I am the son of God? And yet he says it all over the place. You know, and we don't even have to look at statements, you know, like before Abraham was, I am, and that connecting back to Moses and, and going to the people. You, you know, he, he said he's the bread that was sent from heaven to feed the people. He says that he's, you know, the everlasting water, that, that he has the words of life. He says, you know, he says, you know, again, verse 18 And when we combine that with things that he said in in chapter 6 of John, if you're seeking your own glory, then you're not of God. The one that God sent, he's true. There's no unrighteousness in him, and he's only seeking the will of God. And when we look at Christ, what he he said, I came not to do my will, I came to do the Father's will. Came not to do my will, came to do the one who sent me. So on, and, and just back and forth. So he's saying it left and right. And so... He now says he's not only come on his own, uh, but the one who sent him uh, is true. So the people of Jerusalem, they've raised this question of Jesus' origin. And and it's a good issue to raise because instead of disqualifying or or just dismissing him, um, the answer is in fact one of the main witnesses to who he is and the validity uh, of his message and the deeds that, uh, that he's doing. So... They claim to have, they claim to have knowledge, right? But, but they don't. Jesus is the one who knows God, knows who he himself is, and knows the truth about his opponents. The opponents um, are, are really just out of touch with reality, you know? Uh, any thoughts or, or comments? Okay, so verses 30 and 31... So they were seeking to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. And we uh, will address that hour had not yet come and some other stuff when we get to chapter 8. But many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, when the Christ comes, he will not perform uh, more signs than those which this man has, will he? And part of the reason we look in John chapter 20, and we get to our thesis statement there, does anybody remember what it was? That truly Jesus did many other signs that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe and, and believing have uh, everlasting life. Uh, and so that's how, many, you know, we have r- certain recorded miracles, but he, I mean, he was doing things left and right. And so some are believing in him saying, well, if this guy is not the Christ, when the Christ comes, he's not going to be doing more miracles than this guy over here. Because he, he's, he barely sleeps. He doesn't even take time out for a meal. So Jesus, the, the truth incarnate, the word incarnate, John chapter 1 and, and verse uh, you know, 14, well, verse 1 and then drop down to word, 114, in the beginning was the word, and then 114, the word became flesh. So the truth incarnate, because thy word is truth, John 17 and verse 17, he's spoken to the people of Jerusalem. They respond by rejecting him. All right. They don't want anything to, to do with him. At, at this, they tried to seize him. Now, presumably, they were intending to take him to, to the authorities who, as they knew, uh, based on what we've read in previous verses, were trying to kill him. The idea being, okay, so they tried to lay hands on him. They tried to seize him. We're going to take him to the authorities. We know that they want this guy dead. But in any case, they're unable to carry out their will because it's not God's will, which is why here we have that phrase, his hour has not yet come. Right? It's... Right. Right. It is... 
And we are going to get to God's will more in 820, I promise. I promise. Um, but yeah, the, and there is, there is the idea, everything happens. You know, the writer uh, tells us that all things were created by God, for God. In the beginning, in the opening chapter of John, it says all things were created through him and, and what have you. Uh, the idea is that there, it's really referencing the sovereignty of God. We think of Isaiah chapter 6, for example, when, the, when the, there were the seraphim and they were crying out, holy, 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 and, and what have you, and you know, just like they would in Revelation. The idea uh, of God's sovereignty and that everything works on his timeline, not on ours, regardless of what the circumstances are. And events will be used, and how do I say this, to a lesser degree today than in biblical times because of miracles and whatnot in order to fulfill that. Jonah being told to go to Nineveh, right? I'm going to go this way over here. No, you're not. You're going over here. Paul said that there were places that he wanted to go. God didn't want him to go yet. We could apply the same idea of his hour had, you know, like Paul going to Rome, for example. We could apply the same idea of his hour had not yet come. It wasn't time for him to go to Rome yet. So it's the same idea. They, they wanted to lay hands on him, but it wasn't Jesus' time for, for that to happen. Right? And, and we will get into it a little bit more when we get to chapter 8. Um, and I promise it'll be soon. It won't be next year or anything. Um, so these people, like Jesus' brothers, who we read about in verses 5 through 7, says, for not even his brothers were believing in him. So Jesus said to them, and if you have the New American Standard uh, Bible, you'll see a little asterisk there uh, above, uh, right before the word said. Uh, that asterisk means that in the current English, it's translated as past tense, but it was actually written in the Greek in the present tense. So, for example, uh, in verse 6, the text reads, so Jesus said to them, because it's past tense, but it's, in the Greek it's actually, so Jesus says to them, my time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. So what have you, just kind of a little side note as to why, that, why that's there. So these people, they were like Jesus' brothers. Um, they're of the world. They have no sense of God's sovereign plan, uh, which is at work among them. Uh, and their actions confirm that they don't do God's will, because if you look at verse 17 of John 7, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. Because it's, if it's from God, we're going to know that. Because, again, John chapter 5, the scriptures testify of, of Christ and, and who he is. Again, the judgment is taking place. The light is shining, but these people are preferring darkness. And this also alludes back to John chapter 1 and verse 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So it's the same idea. The light is among them. The light exposes error. It chases out darkness, and yet they still cannot see it. Right? So they turn against Jesus, but many in the crowd, they're more responsive, uh, and they put their faith on him. All right, we see in verse, uh, verse 31 there, but many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, when the Christ comes, he will not perform more, more signs. So many people, they are there, they are believing of him. Now, it's unclear as to what signs they're referring to, because he's, John, in his account, um, and I'll just, you know, if I say it, uh, if I say something, by the way, like the Gospel of John, um, I, I'm simply referring to what he wrote. I think we all understand that there is only one gospel. There is only one piece of good news. So please don't think that I'm, I'm trying to divide the, the word in, in such a way. But he's only, re he's only recorded five signs 
uh, up to this point. There's uh, changing the, the water into wine. Uh, there's the healing of the official son, the healing of the paralytic, the, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on water. But he's indicated that there are many other signs as well. Um, John 2 and verse 23 doesn't say specific signs, but it says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, this is John 2, 23, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, uh, which he was doing. And then also in verse 3, or chapter 3 and verse 2, when we're dealing with Nicodemus, it says, this man came by, to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So even though John has only recorded five signs, there are more signs there um, that, the people, that the people have seen and that they're believing, him, believing in him. And signs are certainly intended to lead people to faith. Um, if we were to study the text of miracles, part of the reason that miracles existed, it was to confirm the word uh, and to know that the, the, the apostles and what have you were from God. But, but, it's, but it's unclear whether the faith of these people were solid. Right? There's a lot of people who they may see, even at this time, a miracle and have some faith, but you know, some people, stony ground and the seed doesn't take root and what have you. Other people, you know, birds come, take it away, or false doctrine comes and kind of carries it away and, and whatnot. So there's not really um, a way to know how solid their faith is. They may be like those people in the, uh, in the next chapter uh, that we'll get to on, on, the, uh, on the different soils and whatnot. Uh, any, any other thoughts or comments? Or, well, any thoughts or comments other than mine. <laughs> okay. Verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. So having seen the impact on the crowd, the Pharisees get together with the chief scribes and chief priests. They send servants to arrest Jesus. We read there in verse 32. Now, we know that their attempt is not going to be any more successful than the crowds. Okay, we're, we're, about to, we're about to see that. But John doesn't tell us, they don't tell us whether they seize him <coughs> until after he relates Jesus' teaching about his departure and this great invitation for people to come to him, you know, for this, well, for this living water. Right? And he describes the further division of the people later on. So John's storytelling, it, it kind of conveys how really meaningless, how in, inconsequential their, their threat is. Those who seem to have such power whom the people greatly fear. They're not able to disrupt, even slightly, God's purposes. And that's one of the things that, you know, that... But, and really, it's God's purposes that are just and they're secure for those of us who, who like Jesus, want to do his will. Right? I mean, the scriptures say over and over again, if you are seeking God's will, if you are seeking to do what God would have you to do, yes, there's going to be opposition. The Bible never tells us that there's not going to be opposition. But what it does say is, I will not allow your enemies to prosper. What it does say is, my word will not return void, right? When it, and it does say that there is a way of escape, which is uh, not running away, um, but running closer to God, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of times people will say, well, God will not give me more than I can handle. You will get more than you can handle. I don't know who came up with that. But yes, you will get more than you can handle because if you could handle everything, you wouldn't need God. That's why, that's why you're going to get more than you can handle, but, there, but he will always provide a way of escape. Why, what is that way of escape? It's God, because God is always there. Right? So they want to seize Christ 
But really, there's no point because it's not in God's plans. His hour, Jesus' hour, it hasn't yet come. So there's some security there. So after commenting on his origin, Jesus speaks of his own departure. We're going to read here in verses 33 through 36. So the leaders, they want Jesus off the scene. They want him gone. He, he's a troublemaker. Get rid of him. They're threatening him with arrest and death. And he tells them, uh, really, uh, probably quite calmly, um, there were certainly times when Jesus got upset, um, you know, driving money changers and what have you out of the temple. And even with his disciples, he got frustrated. You know, he, he would sit there, how long am I going to be with you? You know, kinda, are, are you not getting it yet? And, you know, I could just picture him maybe tapping on Matthew's head and kind of being like, hey, think McFly, think. You know, if you remember the old Back to the Future movie. Yeah, could you, not, could you not wait with me one hour? You know, that, that type of thing. So he tells them that he's going to be leaving soon. Crucifixion at this point is probably about six months away. We, we don't know for sure um, since we don't know how much John is actually leaving out, right? Um, we know from Peter that he's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness through knowledge of him that called us out of darkness and into his uh, marvelous light. So we know that we have what we need, but we don't know how much is, is left out. Um, they're going to put him to death, but even in death, he will go to the one who sent him. Right? Um, so in verse 33... He says, therefore, Jesus said, for a little while longer, I'm with you. Then I go to him who sent me. Again, connecting himself to God. The father sent me. God sent me. I do the one of him who sent me. So even though, even though I'm going to die, I'm still going to the one that sent me. You cannot separate me from God, he says. So after the guards are sent, Jesus said, you'll look for me, but you'll not find me where I am. You cannot come, uh, verse 34. So they've been looking for him through this feast, weren't able to find him until he appeared openly. Right? Their seeking has not been like the disciples' seeking. They're, they're judges who stand, um, who stand self-condemned by their response to him. He will be with the Father since he is the way to the Father. Uh, we'd read over in John 14 and verse 6. They cut themselves off from the Father when they reject Christ. Again, Jesus implies that they are alienated from God. However, where there is breath, there is life, right? It is very possible that these people, even those who are rejecting Christ to his face, are righteous people after the fact. It may be that after the crucifixion, you know, they came to the truth, or at some later point, they came to an understanding or a knowledge of the truth, and we just don't have a, have a record of it. But, you know, so he says, you'll seek me, you'll not find me where I am, you cannot come. Then the Jews then said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Still, they're not getting it. Um, he's not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? Uh, what is this statement that he said, you will seek me and will not find me where I am, you cannot come. So they're fulfilling a pattern um, from uh, these wisdom traditions uh, of the Jews. Amos says that the days are coming when this, if we were to look in Amos chapter 8 and verse 12, uh, there it says that the day is coming, you know, it's not there yet, but it's coming when the people will search for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Because, right? again, we've got that 400 silent years between, you know, Malachi and Matthew. You know, God is with them. God's got prophets, and he's got judges, and he's got all of this with them. But the people can't get their act together. So Amos, he started talking, look, there's a day coming when the word of God, is, it's not going to be there. Not that all of a sudden, you know, the Mosaic text, bless you, uh, that the Mosaic texts aren't going to, they're not, that they're not still going to have access to him, but is that he will not be speaking then as he, he was previously. Yes? Well, 
Well, well we are actually going to get there because with the, with the Greeks, there was the Jewish proselytes, the, the different uh, converts uh, that, were, that, uh, that would come. Um, also, we have to remember when Jesus sent out the disciples, when he sent them out two by two, he told them, you know, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans. Uh, Paul, when he was going out initially, it was to the Jews, but then they rejected him, so he went to the Gentiles. Greek, uh, the term uh, Greek, Gentile, pagan, is used interchangeably for, for the same type of people, you know. Um, we, we are actually uh, about to get to that, though. Hopefully in these three minutes. <laughs> Um, so Amos says that, Hosea says that the people's hearts, uh, they're full of prostitution and arrogance, so they'll seek the Lord and not find him because he's withdrawn himself. Uh, that's in um, Hosea uh, chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. And it says, uh, there's some, uh, in Proverbs 1, 28 through 31, it says, Then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me, since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. Why? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Someone said it? Thank you. Wisdom. Uh, and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurred my rebuke. They will eat of the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. That's again Proverbs 1, 28-31. So... We could see from the response uh, of these opponents, uh, now referred to as Jews, in verse 35, um, that they're alienated from God. Jesus spoken of the Father. They completely miss the point. They speculate on where he intends to go. If he were to go among the Greeks, then they would not find him, since they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to go looking for him there. Uh, or perhaps they think that because he has been exposed as a false prophet in Israel that he might go to the uh, Greeks to try to drum up some, um, some support there. Uh, they're keying in on Jesus as a teacher, but they, as they did earlier in the chapter, but they didn't uh, receive his teaching. Uh, any closing thoughts or comments? Anything? Okay, we'll go ahead and stop there, and we'll pick up, we'll just finish up verse 36. Uh, we'll start that on Wednesday.